Aristotle once said that gold was water solidified in the ground and mixed with the sun's rays. Others were sure that gold was made with the help of the philosopher's stone. When the ancient Incas first saw gold, they decided that this metal, falling from the sky, was the tears of a mythical creature. But its real origin seems much more epic. Let's go to a very distant past, to the time when there were no people or animals, to the time when dinosaurs didn't exist yet, to the era when the simplest forms of life were just being formed. Our planet resembled a huge cauldron of chemical elements. There were erupting volcanoes, earthquakes, and lightning flashes all the time. It was about 3.9 billion years ago. During this period, huge asteroids flew through our solar system. They fell on Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. It's possible that asteroids also fell on the moon and left large craters on it. There was a real apocalypse on our planet. But fortunately, no one felt it because there was no life yet. Along with the destruction, the asteroids brought metals. But were there metals on Earth before that? Of course. The core of our planet is mainly made up of metals such as iron. From there, it spreads to Earth's crust, mixes with magma, comes into contact with oxygen, and combines with other elements. But how did they get into the core? Simple hydrogen and helium atoms merged and formed heavier elements inside giant stars. Then, supernovae exploded and formed big clouds of dust and gas. These clouds reached our galaxy and began to revolve around the sun. Over time, this dust and the remnants of stars formed planets. One of them was our Earth. Metals lying in the bowels of our planet are difficult to get. And we wouldn't have the technology we have now if it wasn't for that meteor shower that left metals on Earth's surface. There are two theories. The first suggests that powerful supernova explosions far from our universe formed a lot of metals from the periodic table. During the explosion, nuclear fusion started and it created atoms of gold. Then the blast wave threw those hot pieces in different directions. They flew for a long time, cooled down in cold space, and reached our solar system. Another theory says that gold and other metals appeared because of the merger of two neutron stars. These are powerful giant stars that are many times smaller in size than the sun, but several times heavier than it. These are objects with tremendous gravitational force and density. Their collision formed an intense gamma ray burst of radiation that could synthesize gold. In 2017, astrophysicists observed the collision of two neutron stars for the first time. They found traces of heavy metals, including gold, using gravitational wave detectors. So this theory seems more likely. And what if we go even further? Where did stars come from? Clouds of dust and gas are scattered throughout the universe. They mix, combine into one mass, and grow like a snowball. They squeeze each other and form a gravitational force. When all the material collapses, it starts to heat up. And then, this surge of energy creates a star. Some physicists assume that stars, during their lifetime, can produce most of the elements of the periodic table. If this theory is true, then our body also consists of stars. We may be part of some gigantic supernova that exploded billions of years ago at the other end of the universe. More than 50 years have passed since the appearance of this theory, but no one has proved or disproved it. Okay, let's get back to gold. One of the largest gold deposits in the world is in southern Africa. Scientists believe that the precious metal appeared there more than two billion years ago after the fall of a giant meteorite. People are sure that gold is hidden in the world's oceans. Anywhere from 10 to 20 million tons of this precious metal can be underwater. But those are not large stones, but tiny particles dissolved in liquid. The extraction of such gold is too expensive. Now, let's find out how people mine gold and turn it into jewelry. At first, 
people find gold deposits, large plots of land or rock inside which gold is hidden. Workers begin to use picks, shovels, and machines to extract shiny pieces from the rock. Then these pieces are dissolved in a special acid that separates the gold from the solids. After that, other substances get removed from the precious metal by melting or using gaseous flora. When the gold is purified, it's checked for purity. 99.9% .9 is the benchmark. Done! Your gold is ready to use. You can turn it into jewelry or part of an electronic device. The rarest metals on Earth also got here from stars. I'm talking about rhodium and iridium. They are several times more expensive than gold, not because of their beauty, but because of their practical value. For example, rhodium and iridium can turn harmful gases into harmless ones, and 90% of the demand for this metal falls on the automaker's market. People use these metals in the manufacturing of auto catalysts. They are needed to clean harmful exhaust. When toxic substances produced during fuel combustion come into contact with these precious metals, they become their safer forms. A micro layer of rhodium and iridium is applied to the walls of the catalyst cylinder. Gold, platinum, rhodium, and iridium are the most expensive metals. But what about the most durable ones? It's a little complicated to determine one winner because the strength of a metal depends on four criteria. First, there's tensile strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist tearing. For example, modeling clay has a low tensile strength because you can easily stretch it in different directions. Among metals, tungsten is perhaps the most difficult to stretch. Another criterion is compressive strength. This is the ability of a metal to resist compression. And here, chrome is one of the strongest. The third criterion for the strength of metals is yield strength. To test this, you need to make a rod or beam from any metal and then try to bend it and break it. The metal that shows the greatest resistance has a high yield strength level. And titanium is pretty good for that. And the fourth criterion is impact strength. This shows how strong the metal is when it gets dropped or hit. In this regard, iron shows a good result. Each metal has its own strong and weak sides. Chrome, for example, has a high resistance to compression, but it's weak if you try to stretch it. Therefore, people make metal alloys to combine their strengths. Okay, we've learned about the rarest and most expensive metals. And what about other elements? What's the rarest substance in the world? Meet astatine, the rarest element on the planet. There are about 0.8 ounces of this substance found in the whole world. The rate of its decay is equal to the speed of its formation. Therefore, the amount of the substance in nature doesn't change. People discussed it in the 1800s and discovered it at the end of the 19th century. But even now, after so many years, we know little about this element. In 1869, the creator of the periodic table, Dmitry Mendeleev, learned that there was a certain substance numbered 85 in the group of halogen elements. This group of non-metals includes such substances as fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. So astatine is considered the heaviest of all known halogens and most similar to metals. It has a low melting point and conducts heat and electricity poorly. It's brittle in solid form and has a dark color. Even today, scientists don't know all its properties. It's almost impossible to find it in nature, but chemists have learned to synthesize it artificially. People don't know how to use this element because it's too radioactive. But in some laboratories, scientists conduct experiments using astacine to treat thyroid diseases. Among all the planets of the solar system, our Earth is unique, since it's the only one that has developed life. But what if we got a competitor? What if a second Earth appeared out of nowhere? Then there would be two different scenarios. The first is the destruction of both planets, and the second has an unexpected but pretty logical ending. But let's start with the catastrophic scenario. The second Earth with the same conditions could only exist if it received absolutely the same amount of sunlight as our planet. 
The orbit that our Earth follows is perfect for getting the necessary amount of solar heat. If we were a little further away, the entire surface of our planet would resemble Antarctica. And if Earth were a little closer to the Sun, we'd all live in a huge desert inhabited by very few living beings. So, for the second Earth to be identical to ours, it would need to follow the orbit of our planet. Two massive objects can exist close to each other. The union of Earth and the Moon is a great example. But if the second object was as heavy and huge as our planet, there wouldn't be enough space for both of them. The gravity of two Earths would be a huge problem. The two worlds would collide because they would be pulled toward each other. This process would last for hundreds of millions of years. And in the end, the two planets would transform into one giant world and their remnants would be flying around the newly formed planet, resembling the rings around Saturn. Or, one of the planets would push the other out of its orbit. In this case, one of the Earths would hurtle toward the Sun and burn like a match in its atmosphere. It's also important to remember that Earth is moving at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour at all times. This is more than 80 times faster than the speed of sound. And now, imagine two huge planets that are flying toward each other at such a speed. Even a microscopic organism living in the mouth of a volcano wouldn't stand a chance to survive the collision of two Earths. Even the moon would be torn to pieces by the blast wave. But let's imagine that Earth's twin is following another orbit, somewhere between Mars and Earth. Even in this situation, people's lives would change forever. By the way, the theory that Earth might have a twin appeared long ago. Scientists of the past believed that the second planet could be hiding on the opposite side of the Sun. Thanks to modern technologies and astronomy, we know this theory isn't true. Otherwise, our telescopes and other equipment would have already caught some signals from this planet. Scientists study space objects thousands of light years away from us, so they would definitely notice another world in the neighborhood. But anyway, Let's imagine that the second Earth does exist, and we've discovered it recently. The entire field of astronomy and astrophysics will immediately receive hundreds of billions of dollars in funding. The study of Earth's twin will become a priority goal for people. Experts will put forward hundreds of hypotheses about what the second Earth looks like and what's happening there. The planet is almost at the same distance from the Sun as we are. This means the weather must be the same there. Soon. Scientists find out that Earth's doppelganger has liquid water and continents, but they aren't like ours. Their shapes and location are different. Most likely, life exists there too, but what is its origin? There's a hypothesis that life on our planet appeared thanks to amino acids brought here by a meteorite. It's highly improbable that the same thing happened to another world. Life most likely emerged there in a completely different way. Perhaps the fish didn't get out of the water on that planet, and the first intelligent creatures appeared in the ocean. These could be amphibians with scales and fins, or octopus-like monsters with huge tentacles. Fish on the second Earth could have come out of the water and grown limbs. But what if they didn't like walking on the ground? Then, this world might be inhabited by intelligent bird people. Or, life could have originated deep in the soil. Then evolution would create humanoid moles, or highly developed worms. To find out for sure, scientists send a rover there. A similar mission to Mars was a success, so there shouldn't be any problems with this one. People on Earth are waiting. What will the rover find on the other side? It will take several years for the ship to get there. Strangely, two days after the launch, it returns. But wait, this is not our space probe! All this time, the inhabitants of the second Earth have been watching our planet too. At one point, they also sent a probe. It's made of the same materials as ours. It has a camera and a recording device. But people are worried because the rover looks similar to a mechanical spider. Can it be that giant tarantulas live in that world? Scientists understand that we need to communicate. We send our guests a radio signal with some information about our civilization. They catch this message and send their own. It contains strange symbols that resemble scratches. Linguists all over the world are trying to decipher it. Meanwhile, astronomers send the guests a recording of human speech. A few days later, our satellites catch a message from our space neighbors with their voices. 
Scientists are about to play the recording. The whole world is listening with bated breath. And it's a growl. A terrible and absolutely incomprehensible growl. It has pauses and an unusual rhythm, but it's nothing resembling human speech. The whole planet is panicking. All countries are preparing for an invasion. The most important thing now is to build shields to protect the planet. No one can decrypt the message. It's possible that our neighbors can't understand us either. People make a last attempt to establish some contact. We send a video to explain to our guests with the help of gestures and signs that we only want peace and collaboration. The answer doesn't take long to wait. Our satellite receives their video file. Scientists play back the recording, and it's shocking! We see dinosaurs in robotic suits! Life on the second Earth has been developing in the same way as on our planet. But the infamous colossal meteorite didn't fall there. Over millions of years of evolution, dinosaurs have become sentient. In the video, they're growling and pointing with their claws at the picture of our Earth. Then they start growling even more loudly and… is it laughter? The recording ends. People consider this the announcement of the invasion. Several years have passed. During this time, scientists have exchanged messages with dinosaurs several times, and it seems we're beginning to understand them. It turns out that the reptiles also want peace. They say that their planet was once inhabited by humanoids similar to humans, but a massive flood wiped them away. Dinosaurs managed to survive and evolve into intelligent beings. It will take many years before people set foot on their planet. And when this happens, humanity will feel relieved, realizing that we're not alone. But what if there was no intelligent life on the second Earth? People would also be happy. We would know that we'd always have another home. Perhaps we'd start exploring Earth's twin right away, or begin mining its resources to replenish ours. In any case, our lives wouldn't change immediately, because that land would be too far away from our planet. Dozens of generations would pass before people begin settling on the second Earth. Our homeland planet would be losing more and more resources, so everyone would want to move to a new world. In the beginning, only the richest would be able to do it. But with time, space travel would become cheaper. People would probably invest a lot of money to build a paradise on the second Earth. If this happened, we'd be visiting this world during our vacation to breathe fresh air and enjoy nature. In any case, the human population would grow. This means that sooner or later, the second Earth would become as loaded as the first one. And then, people would start searching for a new home among the stars. By the way, if any life exists on a planet similar to ours, it's likely to look like octopuses. There's even a theory that octopuses came to Earth from some other world. Any animal has several evolutionary stages of development. For example, elephants and mammoths descended from one common ancestor five to six million years ago. Looking even further, almost all mammals evolved from one ancestor they shared with reptiles. Each species has been changing over millions of years. But not octopuses. They suddenly appeared on a family tree. From the point of view of evolution, squids would have to evolve into octopuses millions of years from now. But look, they're already here. Besides, octopuses are incredibly smart. Their genetic code is much more diverse than the human one. They may be visitors from another planet that is similar to ours. But of course, this is only a hypothesis. While choosing the best metal to use for goods exchanging, our ancestors considered many different types. Gold seemed to be a good choice since it's resistant to corrosion and you can melt it over a flame, which makes it easy to stamp it as a coin or work with it in any other way. Gold is not that rare, but is not easy to find and extract in larger amounts with pre-industrial technology. Geologists believe most of the gold on our planet came from space with meteorite storms more than 2 billion years ago. It's one of the densest metals on our planet, and humans have mined around 180,000 tons of it by now. If you want to tell if the diamond you're holding is real or fake, breathe out on it. The genuine diamond will remain transparent, while the fake one will get foggy. There are more ways that you can shuffle a single deck of 52 cards than there are atoms on our planet. Hippos spend around 16 hours a day in lakes and rivers to protect their bodies from the hot sun. They're pretty good swimmers, but most of the time, when it seems like they're swimming, they're just walking or standing on the lake floor. 
The Sahara Desert used to be green because of constant changes in Earth's orbital rotations. Around 11 to 5,000 years ago, Sahara transformed after the end of the last ice age. Sandy dunes slowly became greener because of vegetation growing there. Caverns turned into lakes. Around 3.5 million square miles of the northern part of Africa was green, which attracted such animals as elephants, hippos, antelopes, and others. The definition of a desert includes low precipitation, which means very, very rare rainfall or even snowfall. Back in 1979, Sahara got covered with snow for the first time when there was a half-hour-long snowstorm. A long time ago, before trees were here, our planet was covered with giant white mushrooms. They covered most of the surface and were 3 feet wide and 24 feet tall. A bolt of lightning can reach more than 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's five times hotter than the surface of the sun. One pineapple plant flowers only once and gives just a single pineapple, and it can take three years for this fruit to grow and ripen. In the 18th century, import fees for pineapple were so high that having one at home was a symbol of wealth. People would buy one and display it without eating it and enjoying its taste. We could fit the entire population of our planet in Texas without making it too crowded since there would be 330 square feet per person. The area of Texas is almost 270,000 square miles. If you accidentally forget you have a honey jar inside and someone finds it a couple centuries later, they will still be able to eat it because honey is one of those foods that can be preserved for a really long time. Honey is rich in sugar and contains little water, so bacteria can't grow there. It also contains hydrogen peroxide that prevents the growth of microbes. Scientists even found 3,000-year-old and still perfectly edible honey while excavating Egyptian pyramids. Some other things that can last almost forever are white rice, vinegar, soy sauce, and dried pulses. A bookworm is not just an expression for a person who's really into reading books, but an actual insect that eats microscopic mold and makes holes in poorly kept books. Stoats, also known as the short-tailed weasel, have specific tactics to catch rabbits. They jump, spin, and twist around, which is like they have some kind of dance performance to get their attention. Rabbits start enjoying the show while a stoat is getting closer. Bubble wrap was initially meant to be wallpaper. The creators wanted to invent plastic wallpaper with some kind of paper backing. Another kind of bubble wrap is performing hip-hop while covered in lots of suds. I uh, made that up. The Eiffel Tower needs to get repainted every seven years, which takes a lot of paint. The total amount weighs the same as 10 elephants. It also grows up to 6 inches in the summer because the iron it's made of expands due to the heat. The arches you see at the base of the Eiffel Tower are there for aesthetics. The original design included the four big pylons at the base to support the entire structure. People who were building it thought it didn't look that stable, and they worried visitors would be afraid to go in. They decided to add the arches around the base to make it look safer. Also, there's a secret apartment at the top of the tower Gustav Eiffel, the designer, intended for himself. Jupiter has a mass of over three times larger than the mass of our planet. It also has 69 moons, with a couple of them up to 37 miles in diameter, but most of them are barely one mile wide. Russia has a larger surface than Pluto, by more than 150,000 square miles. Russia has over 6.6 .6 million square miles, while Pluto has only 6.4 million square miles of surface. Russia is also a heck of a lot easier to get to. If you take all the planets in our solar system and got them together, they could fit between the Earth and the Moon. The average distance is almost 240,000 miles, and the overall diameter of all planets standing next to each other is slightly above 233,000 miles. The Pacific Ocean is bigger than all land masses on our planet put together. Some sharks live inside active underwater volcanoes. Scientists discovered the so-called Sharkanos, but couldn't get too many details by sending divers to investigate, since, duh, it's too dangerous. Speaking of sharks, they've been on the Earth for around 400 million years, which is approximately 50 million years more than trees. If you're somewhere in the wilderness and hear a tiger's roar, don't worry! It doesn't have to mean the animal is very close to you, since their roar can be heard even 2 miles away. But they are very fast, though. 
It's relatively safe to stand on 3-inch thick ice covering a water body because this width is supposed to support one person. 4 inches of ice is enough to be safe for a group of people, and 36 inches can take 110 tons of weight. Avocados never ripen while on the tree, so farmers tend to use those trees as some kind of storage to keep avocados fresh until they pick them and sell them. Starfish are pretty exciting creatures with no blood or brain. However, they do have a nervous system and are sensitive to some things such as light or touch, but don't have a centralized brain as we do. They pump seawater throughout their body, which is some kind of blood replacement. Water brings essential nutrients, which help its organs to function. Starfish have eyes at the tips of their arms. They're not good at seeing details as ours, but starfish can recognize different light shades, which helps them navigate their surroundings and hide from bigger predators or hunt for food. The shortest commercial flight in the world is in Scotland, between two isles, Westray and Papa Westray. The distance is only 1.7 miles, and the flight takes only 90 seconds. Getting through security takes longer. One of the world's most famous painters of all time, Vincent van Gogh, sold only one painting during his lifetime. Now his paintings decorate literally everything, from shower curtains and coffee mugs to the most prestigious museums. The biggest snowflake ever was a 15-inch giant the size of a frisbee. A platypus can give you one of the most unpleasant stings a human might experience, because these animals have poison glands in their hind legs. They use a hollow spur on their heels to release the venom. Cats have more toes on their front paws. Like plenty of four-legged mammals, cats have five toes on the front, but they only have four toes on their back paws. Scientists believe that might help them be faster. If you could get into your car and drive up to the sky at the average speed of 60 miles an hour, it would take you only one hour to leave the Earth's atmosphere and get to outer space. You'd have to be prepared well if you decide to keep going up to the moon since it's 250,000 miles away. That would take you as long as driving around our planet 10 times, maybe less than 6 months. Bring a big lunch with you 